So King Charles the Third and the Jews. Okay. So guys, this runs even deeper. So it's it's not just the Ephraim and Edom. I mean, that's sort of that's what he's got in his back pocket. That's his way. But he's he's already working it. He's working the field, man. So six facts about this new K I N G. Uh, Chucky was circumcised by a rabbi. Okay, so he wasn't didn't just go to the hospital and get circumcised, you know. But no, he was specifically circumcised by a rabbi. Okay. A brilliant physician, one of London's leading Mohalim, Jewish ritual circumcisers. So this guy is doing it. They're doing it right with this guy from the very beginning in terms of getting him in with the Jews. Okay. He's getting in with the Jews right away. Circumcised by the top Jewish ritual circumciser. Okay. And he has a great relationship with the Jews. He's been, you know, working with them, visiting them for a long time. And, uh, Actually, I think one of his relatives is buried on the Mount of Olives. I forget which one. I think his aunt or something's buried there. So there's a lot going on here with the Jews. And uh, he's got his own personalized kippah. Now, the kippah is that little hat that he wears, uh, the yarmulke that they wear on their heads. Uh, he has his own uh, kippah. I'll show you that in a second. Uh, he's friends with the leading Orthodox rabbi, the chief rabbi of Britain, and uh, uh, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. I know I'm not calling anybody rabbi. I'm just saying that's that's what they're calling them. Uh, but uh, Jonathan Sachs, who's he's, he's uh, you know he's you know he's friends with these guys. He's close close to these people. He does a lot in the Jewish community, so he's tied in. So when you say, oh, but they won't respect him or they won't listen to him, uh, think again. They they love this guy. They think he's amazing. Um, he's got a great relationship with the Jews, as we'll see. A couple other thoughts on this. He's a friend to UK Jewry with a special and historic ties to Israel. Now, this is in the times of Israel. So this is how they feel about him. They think he's awesome. They think he's amazing. Uh, isn't it ironic, though? It turns out he's an Edomite. Now, look at that flush red face he's got going there. The ruddy complexion and the red. You could argue there's red eyebrows, actually. His eyebrows are looking kind of red there. Uh, He's long had a good relationship with the British Jews, outspoken on anti-Semitism, short up Israel bona fide. So listen, they're looking for a leader. This guy's, hey, I'm I'm tribe of Ephraim. I'm going to help you guys get everything you always wanted. I'm going to deliver. They're going to be like, yeah, amen. We've been waiting for that. Awesome, right? They're not going to be, you know, he's already got the pedigree. He's got the pedigree going for him. And uh, he's all in with the in crowd as far as the Jews are concerned. Okay, a couple more thoughts on this. But wait, there's more. Don't go away. There's a lot more coming. <laughs> All right. Uh, see, here's this velvet kippah. It's the kippah. Do it for the kippah. Um, so that's that blue uh, hat he has on there. Um, and uh, it's personalized. It's monogrammed, I guess, for him. But uh, that's what he wears when he's with the Jews because as far as he's concerned, you know, they're concerned he's a Jew. See, he's everything to everybody. That's how the Antichrist is, guys. The Antichrist is everybody's, you know, that, that's what Paul said. To the Jews, I became like a Jew. To those without the law, I became like those without the law, even though I'm not free from Christ's law. You know, but he was like, I became all things to all people so that by all possible means, I might, might win some. Well, that's exactly what the Antichrist does. He's the Christian. He's got the Christian thing going with all the holy oil and the, and the three days and three nights and, you know, working the whole uh, in the, in the hoopah with the Jews. And then he's got, he's got all the Christian, uh, you know, iconography there and the, and the artifacts. And then he's got the Jewish angle, but he's not done. He has a Muslim angle too. He's got all the angles guys. This guy has all the angles. So if you want one guy who's going to come in and bring all the people together more so than the Pope or anybody else, this guy seems to have it. He seems to have it in all the right places. And again, he seems kind of unassuming. You'd never think, Oh, well, this guy's the antichrist. Come on. Uh, but that's the whole point. The Antichrist masquerades as an angel of light, right? So you're never going to think, you know, you never hear really neg a lot of, I mean, other than the fact that he's unfaithful to his wife and, you know, kind of typical <laughs> run of the mill sins, but you don't hear kind of like G A T E S level or, uh, no, those are his minions, right? S S O R O S and S H W A B. Those guys are all his minions. You think they're the ones in charge. They're not the ones in charge. This guy, he's the one who's in charge. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but long friend to the Jews. King Charles is a mensch for all seasons. A mensch is means like an honorable guy, like a good guy, a guy you can trust, right? The English monarch is noted, a noted fan of Jewish culture and has championed many a Jewish cause. 
And, and again, if the time came to it, he could make the argument that he is Jewish. You know, they're, they're kind of leading up to that with all the science and everything. He really is on David's throne and he really is a, an Ephraimite. And, really, you know, and, and we're looking for the Messiah Ben Ephraim. It's him, right? So they've been, they've been building all that so that the right moment he can, he can release that and say, yep, it's me. I really am. And they're going to be like, yay. Why would they fight it, right? Because he's going to give them everything they want. And that's all they really want. They don't really want the Messiah. They want what they want. And so if someone comes along and says, I'll give you what you want, then they'll, they'll accept him. You know, as long as, you know, and if he's friendly with the, uh, with the Muslims, as we're going to see too, and with the Christians, it's like, then everybody says, yeah, okay, great. One world religion. Here it is. Um, King Charles has always had a special relationship with the Jewish community, both officially and in his personal life. Our new monarch has, our new monarch. So this is the rabbis calling him their monarch. See? So these are all the Jewish publications saying, we love this guy. This guy's awesome. He's our man, right? That's huge, right? They're already giving him the shoe in to, that if he were to step forth and say, hey, guys, you know, I'd like to take this role and, and be your Messiah Ben Ephraim, I think the rabbis are going to be like, yeah, awesome, bro. Sounds good to us. Um, you know, and, and whether or not he, you know, I, I, however he does it, you know, if he's, if he's the one who confirms this covenant, again, Confirm me a covenant. The word is actually strengthen, strengthen a covenant or that the covenant will prevail. So it's been argued that maybe he'll even put it into motion even if they don't want it and then he'll just prevail anyway. But since he has this great relationship, then they might be all for it. Look at that ruddy complexion. I mean, that's got Esau written all over it. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's pretty interesting. Okay, let me keep going here. So I'm just sort of taking my time, strolling, strolling through. Uh, who knows the king? See, even the way they phrase it. Again, another Jewish insider. These are all Jewish publications. The Jewish insider. This is what they say. King Charles III has built extensive relationships with the UK's Jewish community. So they love this guy. They're like, yeah, this is awesome. We can't wait for this guy. Now, a lot of other people aren't so happy about him becoming the king. You know, they're upset about what happened with Diana. They're upset about this. But not the, not the Jews at large. The Jews are like, yeah, we love. he's all about us. He wants to help Israel. He wants to bless us. He wants to, you know, that's exactly how, he, how, how, how an antichrist would come in, right? He's not going to come in as an enemy. He's coming in as your best friend. He's coming in as like the guy who's going to solve all our problems. You know, he's going he's gonna to bring peace to Israel, right? So they, they're loving this guy. Okay, let's keep going here. Um, he's got his kippah going there. Six facts about King Charles and the Jews. Okay, keep going. Now, I guess with her, she kind of had, she didn't spend as much time with the Jews. Now, this is what's interesting about this and why I want to put forth a thought here. Could, could this woman, Elizabeth, who claimed to believe in Jesus Christ and claimed to be a follower of Jesus Christ, I'm, I'm not judging her, that's for God to, to make that decision. Could it be that she herself was a restrainer of sorts? I'm not saying she's the restrainer, okay? Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But could it be that God was using her in partly, you know, it was a 70-year thing, similar to what happened in, in Israel when they were taken to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is, not, you know, was a restrainer of sorts. He's not the restrainer. He's not the Holy Spirit, obviously. But, uh, but he, was, he was restraining them for a time for 70 years. And, and then the, the kings that followed as well. So they played a role in in the journey of the Jews. Could it be that she too was playing a role that just happened to end at 70 years and then this guy just happens to come in in the first world first year where they declare this new to the world to the order. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, Prince Charles unveils a statue honoring powerful medieval Jewish mom. So he's always got his hands in whatever's going on with Jewish anything Jewish. He's there, he's unveiling it himself. He's very involved, and so they just love him. They're like, man, this guy loves the Jewish people. He loves us, man. He's always looking out for us. Here he's having a dance-off with Anne Frank's sister. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't get any more iconic than that. He's dancing with Anne Frank, Anne Frank's sister. Okay, we all know the diary of Anne Frank, who uh, you know, died during World War of the Two. And uh, here he is dancing with her sister. I mean, the guy just knows how to make all the right connections and do all the right things in the public eye to go, wow, what a great champion of the Jews, right? Now, could it be all this is just a bunch of hoo-ha, he really has nothing to do with any of that, and maybe he is just a great champion of the Jews? Maybe. 
Maybe. But uh, from what we understand, he's the guy behind all this tyranny that's going on right now. He's the guy. Not those other guys. Those are his minions. He's the one actually in charge. He doesn't seem like he is, right? And they never seem like they are. But he's actually the guy. So it seems from everything that I've been studying uh, and what God seems to be revealing is that he is actually the one calling the shots behind the scenes. He's always the one leading the speeches at all these COPs, uh, 26, 27. You know, he's always the one giving the key, keynote speech. He's always the one. It's not O-B-A-M-A or Mr. T or any of these other guys. It's always this guy who's got his hands deep in it and he loves the get rid of the people uh, D of the pop of the late Sean. Um, he loves that agenda. He's all about that agenda. His dad was all about that agenda. And we're going to touch on that as well. So he's unassuming, but that's perfect, right? That's perfect. That he just seems like a bumbling, unassuming guy, right? And yet in reality, he's got his hands in all of this and he's behind the scenes working all of it. And that's just the perfect way, you know, to come across like uh, Emperor Palpatine, right? Emperor Palpatine from Star Wars. You never would have thought that guy was going to turn into, uh, you know, well, Senator Palpatine, I should say. You never thought he was going to turn into some Sith Lord. You know, he just thought he's just some, you know, affable senator, affable senator, you know, unassuming senator, right? That's this guy, right? Check this out. Born the same year as Israel. Can you believe that? Isn't that perfect also? I mean, wouldn't you have the nemesis born at the same time? as as uh as as your your child as as the Christ so to speak um you know if he's re rebirthing Israel wouldn't it make sense that he rebirths the antichrist or births the antichrist at the same time or the son of per perdition so that they're both on par with each other and they're both coming of age they're both coming to the age of 80 at the end of this you know the 2030 they're both coming to 80 years isn't, isn't that significant as well? Isn't it interesting that Israel was born during the Passover time and that he would be born during the fall feasts, right? It's kind of symbolic as well. Christ comes during the time of life and rebirth and, and uh, being born again. And, uh, and then the evil comes during the time of death, right? To bring the destruction on the, on the flip side. He's, he's the chiasmus. He's the balance to that coin. So I thought that was really intriguing as well.